Hi, Mike. I'm Paulina. So I'm wondering, yep, this question's for Mike. If you can just give us or give us a bird's eye view of your take on the issues of who owns the sky, the FAA, and privacy laws. And my only experience comes from watching the videos of Trappy, who I love. Of, of who? Trappy. Have, do you know Trappy? No, I don't. Know oh, you, everyone should Google Trappy. He has a ma he's a drone pilot, and uh, he does the ones like you know he did the one over the Statue of Liberty, and he's worldwide known, and his videos are just he's an amazing pilot, okay. drone pilot. Yeah. So just FAA privacy laws. Who owns the sky? So there was a chicken farmer uh, near uh, Air Force Base. And uh, during World War II, the planes were flying in at lower altitudes, and his chickens were going insane and smashing into the sides of the building. And he sued the US Air Force. This went up to the Supreme Court. And it was determined that I think 82 feet above your property you own, something like that. Um, so when we fly drones, we... Um, legally cannot fly over anyone who is not part of the project. So when you see someone flying over a stadium with, with a drone, they either have a really, really special permit or they're doing it illegally. Uh, usually in the past it was done illegally. Now most of those people are on board and doing it properly. Um, I love getting great pictures. Uh, we often take the smaller drones when we fly the bigger drones and take kind of uh, oblique pictures to put in presentations. Um, but we are really careful of privacy issues with people, um, mainly because we want to continue to fly and try to answer our questions. Um, this is an interesting thing. Uh, University of uh, New Hampshire is trying to develop its own drone policy of where people can fly. There have been um, some peeping Tom issues here on campus. There's been three of them with, with a drone. Um, so students are only allowed to fly in one area. Uh, we, whenever we fly near or on campus, we alert the, the chief of police and he okays it uh, and knows that we're flying and why we're flying. And then if we're flying on lands owned by UNH, we contact the woodland manager, Steve Eisenhower, who then also knows what's going on and makes sure that we're not complicating any forest uh, ext tree extraction or anything like that. So I don't know if I answered your question. Um, I just hope that, um, what was the person's name again? Trappy. Trappy. I hope he's following uh, the rules. Uh, I imagine he probably <laughs> is. Um, so. <laughs> oh, is he really? Okay. I would say that there's a, a a great poem by Mary Oliver, naturalist poet. It's called Three Rules to Remember. If you're still dancing, you can break the rules. Sometimes breaking the rules is just extending the rules. Sometimes there are no rules. That's a hard quote to follow up on, but I, <laughs> I, have, a, I have a more mundane question, and that is, it's really interesting to me when you've talked about um, Google Earth Pro having Landstat data from 1982 on, and that um, pretty much anybody can go in and do research. I'm just wondering about other, um, other sources of open data, and then the data that you're producing, how are you making it out? You, you talked about the Creative Commons licenses and so forth. So, I mean, um, I think one of you said something about that remote sensing was looking at change over over time, and and so you need this using the Wayback Machine. That seems oh, like a f to well to any of you. I, I feel like using the Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine is really cool, um, but that's probably not how we should be getting getting a hold of NASA data. So so what are you doing to to well, to make this data public and and accessible over time? The Forest Watch data is was published every year by Barry and his team. Uh, and is available on the Forest Watch website, still, still up and running as far as I know. So that data is there. And, and just like the GLOBE data is also there and accessible. And I'm sure that there's probably data that Mike accesses through the university library here. So that uh, you just 
go to the website and find the years or years that you're looking for uh, and download the data. So at least that's the, that's the way that I would work with it with my students. Now, Barry may have some other suggestions as well. I'll, I'll just uh, reinforce the issue of uh, Google Earth and the fact that the data are there. They've already been processed. Uh, they're in a true color format, and so you can't change the band combinations. But with Google Earth Engine, you can do that. Takes a little bit of coding, but it, it can be done. But just if you're interested in knowing what your hometown looked like back in 82 or 86 or, or whatever, go to Google Earth. And uh, they have something called a uh, time slide um, when you want to do more than just look at the image. You pick out the image, you zoom in to, so you see your house and, and that sort of thing. And then you can click on a menu item that allows you to slide back in time. And what you're looking at uh, real time is uh, 2018 data, sometimes 2019 data. But you want to go back. So you go back, and there's a, a face of a clock with a backwards pointing arrow, so it's intuitively obvious. And you click on that, and boom, comes the whole list uh, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, all the way up to the present. And you can pick out what year you want to know. Uh, we do, um, we work with a, a company called Journeys in Film. Does anyone, has anyone heard of Journeys in Film? Write it down. It's an amazing free educational program. And they take films that, are, that have educational material in them. And all you use hidden figures. Or One Strange Rock. Yeah, One Strange Rock, yeah. Um, hidden Figures has a lot of math in it. And um, so you can go to Journeys in Film, download that film for free, show it to your students, and then they provide you with a set of curriculum guidelines to do math activities, science activities, what, whatever you'd like. And, All key to the standards. Yeah, yeah. and so it, it's an amazing educational tool. And when uh, Phil and I gave a, a workshop for 20 teachers or so, a month ago, and there was only one out of that group that had heard of Journeys in Film. But now they're all chomping at the bit for next semester, of course, to yeah. use that. But uh, just an amazing educational supplement that's free. It's just amazing. And by the way, to reiterate what, to reiterate what Barry was saying about uh, One Strange Rock, the remote sensing visualizations in that will, will just blow you away, seriously. So I teach remote sensing and we use Google Earth Engine. Um, so Google Earth is great for viewing the, maybe a time series or a single thing, but you can actually get the data and manipulate it with Google Earth Engine. And a good example of how powerful it is is I bring in an old reel-to-reel -reel computer data tape of Landsat. We look up what the path in the row is and what year it was. They write one line of code and it's instantly available um, online. Uh, it, run through a browser, so you don't need any special software, it's free. And then we remove the, just the path row and then they can see the 2,700 images instantly on the screen during that year that was collected by Landsat. So it's a really amazing, powerful tool. It has the modus, modus data in its products, elevation maps, uh, population data sets, um, river networks. Uh, we are using it as our primary data processing. We even upload our drone data now to Google Earth Engine. What used to take on my nice servers here at UNH about three days to run, takes about 15 seconds now to run. So it's, it's, it's a total game changer to access all this Landsat as well as to do stuff 
super fast. For free. <laughs> I would like to suggest as, as librarians something to you. Uh, most of you probably at one point or another took an AP course, advanced placement course. AP testing is done in the early part of May of every year. So from the end of May till the, usually the second week in June, or excuse me, the beginning of May till the second week in June, you have roughly a month of free time as an advanced placement teacher to do projects with your students. So if you as a librarian, maybe you're, you're a university librarian or maybe you're a high school librarian, I don't know, but perhaps providing services in the form of supporting uh, the journeys in film activities, you know, monitoring change over time via the, the uh, um, uh, One Strange Rock activities or other movies that are on there. So that, that would be a, an outreach that you could do with high schoolers within your general area of the university to provide support in, and doing scientific research using that kind of data. So just a suggestion. Eugenia says I can ask two questions. They're short. <laughs> one, the, the, the easier one, I think, is for Mike, and it's about the ESRI uh, data facilities, ESRI. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, the, and the harder one, I think, is if we have to think about, no, which we do, all the adverse um, possibilities, where do we plant the trillion trees? Thank you. Okay, so to answer Esri, uh, we do use Esri, which does ArcGIS, ArcMap Online. Um, the course I teach, I use QGIS, which is an open source and free uh, GIS platform. Um, and there's benefits to both. Um, I would not trust people if they say, I only use one. It's kind of like having two different motorcycles. You can decide which one to drive on different days, as well as, there's benefits to each of them. Um, we, I teach open source to be different than another GIS professor here online or on campus, as well as um, if you're working with nonprofits or other countries that can't afford that, um, you should have that ability to do GIS and not have it be a $10,000 program that can only be used at universities or EPA or something like that. I, I think that Esri also provides free uh, and I'm not sure there is like a, a beta version or some form of, of Esri that's available for free uh, online, uh, especially for high schools. So that's something that you can do. As far as where to plant the trees, the key is not so much planting the tree, is maintaining the tree for those first two or three years. Making sure it's watered, maybe getting some nutrients uh, to try and make sure that it has a good start for survival. But, but where, where would you plant? Where do you not have the ozone, NOx, the SO2, et cetera? Well, the, that's going to be everywhere. But what we're trying to do by planting the trees is removing some of that stuff. So even though the, even though the trees are damaged by it, they also help in terms of helping to remove it. Uh, and the, um, it's called trilliontrees.org is where that young man, Felix Finkbeiner, has his website. Now I'll let you, do you have anything to say on that, Barry? Uh, uh, if you go to the Forest Watch website, but that is for New England, and I don't know where you are from. Are you, oh, right here, okay. You can get uh, the satellite imagery for all of New England for a particular date, and you'll see that by the coast, there's a lot of ozone, and so there's red over big cities, a lot of ozone, and there's red, and that sort of thing. But as you get further north, in Vermont, in New Hampshire, especially in Maine, <laughs> um, that would be a place you could go that would not have ozone yet. Okay. I'm gonna add, uh, Barry and I have been working with OLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, 
And Barry also works with the U.S. Forest Service. And we're trying to train docents, the gray panthers we talked about, uh, uh, to, uh, to kind of monitor changes in tree health here in New England. And sugar maples are threatened and are actually in decline because of the, the problems associated with the air pollution. There's a new pest, a beetle of some sort, that uh, affects beech and oak trees and can actually cause total defoliation in roughly six weeks and death, you know, for red oak, black oak, beech trees, I think, as well. Uh, so planting white oak would be the ideal because apparently that one is not susceptible to this new uh, introduced threat. So uh, I'm sure that we could probably figure out trees for you to plant and where to plant them. And so we'll hopefully add it to the SOS website. There's mention of a DOE, DOI uh, question. Um, and we've, we've originally worked with, uh, with uh, Harvard University Library to have them uh, develop the DOI and then store our drone data set there. Uh, I think University of New Hampshire now has the ability to license or give out DOIs and so we're starting to do that now. The other place we put data sets is uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and uh, they have long-term storage for pretty large data sets. And so we've done some of our LIDAR data sets that we have in Indonesia there, so. Actually, that was kind of following up on my question. Uh, it was gonna be, because uh, you're handling so much data, where do you store it, how do you preserve it, and do you have any horror stories of needing to find stuff and you can't? And uh, hopefully there's a happy ending, but what has that ever, how do you guys handle your research data management? Um, I should be better. Uh, <laughs> and um, Christina, who works for our group, is very good at getting the DOI numbers and make, making sure some of the data sets are backed up. Uh, we do have kind of a protocol to have them on different servers. Uh, we do have a drive that we copy and bring home. Um, and a lot of our data sets now are starting to be, you know, stored on Oak Ridge National Laboratories, so we are less concerned about it being lost on our hard drive once it's stored there. Uh, I have a question, a technical question for you, Mike, I think. Uh, it's not tree-related, not because I don't love trees, but because um, I have a project that I worked on with regard to uh, what are sometimes referred to as the Benjamin Franklin milestones. These are granite blocks with mileage carved into them, placed along mail routes when Franklin was involved in the post office. And some of them are still findable and existing. I found them in my area and tracked them. And they're, in fact, somebody did a book around 1920, uh, actually a scrapbook, where he had gone out and photographed them as they existed then and mapped them with his own hand-drawn maps. So my question is, to try to find the ones that are still findable, do you think drones could get down low enough to be able to see them because they're generally immediately alongside the road, so it'd have to be a very small drone and to see into sometimes overgrown grass and shrubbery and so on, to realize that there is one of these stones. They're about the size of a small headstone. I, I'm not sure. I think it would be quite difficult, especially through grass. Um, I think LIDAR would be the answer there. Uh, a lot of states have LIDAR collections that are airborne uh, that can provide in information. Um, there's a guy in Connecticut, William, at University of Connecticut, William Omet. And he's been doing, um, really trying to find the old um, stone fences, um, stone walls in New England as delineators of, of land parcels, as well as some of these, uh, I guess they used to burn, have charcoal huts or whatever for some, some of their logging, and he's been able to find mm -hmm. these as well. Um, so going along those lines and maybe finding some of those road systems and then, and then going there in person. I think it would be a combination of some library research to find out where they are, looking at some drone data, and then boots on the ground. And as much, it, one of the things that, as much as I do remote sensing, 
NASA builds the satellites and then I run around on the ground with drones or with, with you know, spectrometers or measuring trees because you really do need boots on the ground. Nothing does beat sometimes eyes and, and, and a little bit of uh, uh, effort on the ground. Perfect uh, lead in to, uh, you know, the uh, boot camp. Uh, if, if we can spread the word that we need boots on the ground, that would be really important. So I know that we're closing up here shortly, and I'm, I was a former forestry student here. Um, so I'm aware that there is some cool ground sampling that happens. I doubt this audience is aware of the use of shotguns and rifles to do leaf sampling. So I wondered if you could just speak to that, because I think that's a fun thing, and it, uh, it does I, go to the boots on the ground and data validation. Uh, I am NRA certified with this with the special stance. I've taken the training course. So, people are really interested in the leaves, foliar, the leaves, and it, you can shoot them down with um, slingshots, difficult, you can have someone climb it up, time consuming, or you can shoot them down with a shotgun. And so what, I don't know, Scott Ollinger was the, I, was the first person that I knew who did it. He's at here. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Huh. Okay. Huh. So, so basically, we have a special training with um, NRA certified instructors. We have a special stance developed just for forest ecologists because normally you don't shoot straight up with it right against your shoulder, um, and it's difficult to shoot straight up and hit hit the leaves. Uh, when I started to do it 15 years ago. Um, it was easy. I did it last year, and I had a bruise on my arm. I was sore for two days with just two shots. But it's a really effective way to sample um, foliage easily. Yeah. Um, I was never a big fan of hunting. Um, I was afraid of guns. And so I never used the shotgun method. We used pruning poles. And six foot by six foot by six foot and you'd hook them together and weave them up through the trees. And I did some field work in Siberia back in 91, and the Russians loved the pruning poles. <laughs> they thought these were really, really special. And we got to the point where one Russian would get on the shoulders of a second Russian, another one would climb up onto the, you know, be the third person, and then they'd have uh, these six foot uh, pruning pole pieces get heavy yeah. when you get, you know, six. six or eight. And they had 12, and they were hugging onto the tree. I have a picture of it. I can. <laughs> Show it to you later. But, so there are alternatives to shooting the trees. And uh, we never, uh, at the Jet Propulsion Lab, it was suggested that we might want to test the sensitivity of leaves to gunshots. You know, because if you use a shotgun, unless you're using, you know, a slug, you, you get a lot of holes in the leaves. And that kind of defeats the purpose of finding a healthy, happy leaf. So I, I can't speak to the shotgun method, but I, I know that Scott was certainly one doing that. So I wanted to use drones to have a little clipper and collect the leaves and bring it up. <laughs> but what's really interesting is, is you, you, you talk to people about these different methods, and sometimes people have great ideas, they go with it. I wanted to do insect collection, so the way that entomologists often collect canopy insects is they fumigate the whole thing. All the insects die and they drop to the ground. And what I suggest is taking some sort of flypaper on a drone and just fly back and forth over the top of the canopy. And it's so interesting that some entomologists are like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, let's figure out. And then some are just like, I don't know what you're talking about. I like to kill them. I don't know, it's just, it's, it's just a, different, a different mentality. So it, it's, it's, it's good to have the different methods as well as yeah. you, you'll probably run into all sorts of people who will go with an idea or not. So. There's always a bucket truck. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, what an excellent way to end our Q&A. One final round of applause, please, for our amazing speakers.